everybody, Patrick Hunter here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. We got that like Voltron thing going on. We got the Lord of the Rings, the the con- consolidation of all of the power between the podcasting titans. Got Bryn Jonathan Butler, of course, author, filmmaker, and then my buddy, CompuBox operator, Eris Pina, who is also my buddy in kind of boxing history dumb, coming together, talking about heavyweight stuff. Man, what a fight the other night, you guys. Alexander Usyk, the brand new undisputed heavyweight champion. Tyson Fury is not anymore. <laughs> but man, what a fight. Great fight. Amazing. I mean, I was absolutely blown away by the ebbs and flows of it. I was at, I had a, that was an emotional roller coaster for me the entire fight. That was just one of those. I mean, considering I don't like, I was working it, but like just watching it as a trying to, you know, digest everything that was going on. There was so many like that's the reason why we love boxing. That's the reason why I love heavyweight boxing. You know what I mean? Is that like when it comes together for a great fight, really nothing can touch it and you know, the way the fight started and then how it changed in the middle rounds and you thought that Usyk was going to drown and Fury was just going to be too big and beating him up. And then the way he resurged himself and then beat the shit out of Fury. Like, you can't... It, it just... It went as perfect as, like, you know, you can have imagined it as a fight can go. I mean, uh, Eris, you called uh, Alexander Usyk by decision. I thought Tyson Fury was going to get it. I mean, I was I was close. It was a split decision, of course, but nonetheless... You obviously called it, Bryn. What did you think was going to happen going into it? We didn't get you on the on the preview show, but like, what what was kind of your thought coming in? I came into it thinking it was going to be an Usyk knockout. I I thought he was going to be able to because I I just thought he was able to do it with Joshua, the technique, the skill, power, and you know the determination that he's just willing to go into the fire with Fury. I mean, to use Teddy Atlas's term, like you've got that kind of reach, you're forcing a guy to enter into a bad, bad neighborhood, knowing he's going to get mugged. And Usyk just did not in any way back down. And he was taking some mammoth uppercuts that I didn't even think Fury was really putting his weight into. He's still so big. They're just colossal, you know, like he's just turning them. And then Usyk made a little bit of an adjustment where those uppercuts were coming across Fury's body. So he really couldn't get the force into them than he was before so again just Usyk making these adjustments and I just thought he was going to be able to do that and finally I thought some of the arrogance of Fury contending with somebody who was showing more skill than he'd ever faced um, I thought that Usyk would be able to just find a way and I knew he would never back down he was completely willing to go out in his shield he seemed to get hurt maybe I don't know four or five times those body shots he definitely didn't enjoy. Those uppercuts were nasty. But I just fundamentally think in that custom auto way, two guys that have equal skill, I'm not saying they have equal skill, but with what Fury has with the size advantage, 40 pounds as well, you saw Fury being unwilling to come forward. You saw like despite all of the advantages he brings coming forward, how devastating he is, he was unwilling to do it. And in the last few rounds, he said like his corner kind of let him down by not saying he needed to step it up even more. He did step it up. He just was unwilling to take those risks because he was getting tagged in a way that he never had before, not because this guy had more reach like Wilder did uh, or, or like a similar reach, but just because his willingness and determination was more than what Fury had. And that's always an interesting moment when a, you see a guy across from you as competitive as Fury is, which obviously he's demonstrated by coming back from these massive knockdowns. Usyk wanted it more than Fury. And I don't think Fury's ever faced that before. And I thought it would be enough for Usyk to put him away. And then something we got to talk about is that eighth round. Very, very weird refereeing in how that's handled. You, If the ropes keep you up the first time, Okay, then it happens again the second time, and then the third time you jump in and protect Fury from getting put away with a completely legitimate shot if you're saying the ropes are allowed to keep him up. Why are you jumping in? And then the announcers of the fight are saying, this was brilliant refereeing, and if you don't understand boxing, you don't understand what this referee was doing. It's not consistent. (laughs) <laughs> like within those like 10 seconds, it was not consistent refereeing. However, he's interpreting the rules. So that was a weird situation. And I think Usyk should have been allowed to put him away based on the way the referee was handling it. And the referee saved them. 
was close, dude. It was damn close. And I mean, in terms of personal perspective, Eris, like how when you, we've already seen Alexander Usyk a bunch of times, so you're familiar with him, you know, like his style a little bit or whatever. But I mean, uh, somebody who is so skilled on the heavyweight level, and I mean, uh, when's the last time we're actually seeing a heavyweight champion coming into a fight like in shape? You could actually see muscle definition. <laughs> it's not really that often, and it's been almost almost fucking ten years at this point. But uh, yeah, it's it's actually uh, from a personal perspective, I guess I, I'm asking like, how difficult was it for you to count this? Like you're having to concentrate on what Oleksandr Usyk was doing or what, from your perspective, like how did it look? Um, I mean, like it was, it wasn't, it wasn't the most difficult fight I've ever had, but I mean, in terms of like importance and knowing that like, like his work yeah, was pretty you know, clean, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But like, just in terms of like importance of the fight, knowing you got to be on your a game for that and just trying to stay like, you know, mentally, like stone face during the whole thing, especially watching how it unfolds. That's the, that's the one that's like makes it most difficult, but I'll say like this, you know, um, Usyk going to the body made, that was easy to count like this, that, that body work was brilliant right from the very beginning theory as big as he is. And as you know, we make fun of his size and all this other stuff, whatever, but like, he's a slick guy too. Like he's awkward and he's hard to hit with a clean shot to the face sometimes. I mean, as the fight goes on and he like gets a little bit tired or whatever it is, he can get tagged more so. But like he has a way of like, you know, uh, rolling with his shoulders and moving his head. He has good upper body movement. And like he slides and slips a lot of those punches. And a lot of those, especially when Usyk threw a couple, you know, flurry, you got to like keep in mind, are these actually landing? Are they not? Because a lot of them were just kind of going off the shoulders of Fury. Some of them were landing clean, but especially early on, you know, when he was like doing his jig and doing all the Fury doing Fury things um it makes it more difficult but like once i got into a rhythm you realize how the pattern of the fight was going and stuff like that fury was being the more active guy too so on that end that was you know you have to watch that and trying to count on Usyk, it's difficult too because Usyk is the type of guy that's pretty like elusive and um to land a really clean punch on is not the easiest thing so but yeah, it was his body work really early on. Like, he landed 70 body punches throughout the fight, and right away from the beginning of it, he was just going right in there, landing, you know, tapping him with a jab to the body, jab to the body, then a straight left to the body, jab, jab, boom, boom, boom. And that's just investment work, you know what I mean? That's all you can do. Like, a Fury, if he's elusive upstairs, but he has such girth down there, touch it. Like, he's not going to be able to move that. Well, that's what Wilder was doing in their third fight. He was jabbing him to the body. That's what a lot of, that's what a lot of guys try to do to him. And that's the right move because, well... It's, it's there for you. I mean, Fury can take it, clearly. He's always making videos of people punching him and throwing things at him and showing that he's trying to be Superman down there and all that, whatever. But, like, that's still going to add up points. And as the fight built on, though, you know, I found that I think the big turning point for me was around, because um, he got hurt in the ninth. I think it was the eighth round, though, is when you notice things that are taking a turn again. Like, because Usyk was slowing down in the middle of the fight, and I was like, all right, well, I see where this is going now. Fury really is, like, starting to beat him up. Yeah, it was and, the end of yeah, the eighth. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and and he had caught a rhythm too. Not only was it like you know just in trying to impose his size or doing his thing, like he did have a rhythm going on. And Usyk seemed like a little out of sorts because Fury was in the zone, and he was doing really good body work at that point too. But yeah, it was the eighth round, I think, that like Usyk landed a combination, and Fury backed up and he started rubbing his nose, and clearly he was bothered by that. Yep. I, I even messaged you at the end of that round, like he's blowing his nose. Something yep. happened, and. Once you saw that, and Fury is that type of dude that, like, you know, he has, he's one of the most, he has some of the greatest recuperative powers I've ever seen in a fighter, but he doesn't have a poker face. If you hurt him, you can clearly tell you hurt him. You know what I mean? Like, he makes a little bit of a stress look. He looks a little out of sorts. He, he gets that, he like, eh, eh, yeah, kind yeah. Of look and on he his starts face. backing up, trying to, like, you know, <laughs> as he's, like, slightly discombobulated, trying to, like, gather himself. But it shows on his face. And that's why guys get excited because they're like, oh, shit, like, I got him for a second. And let me capitalize on it. And you saw that clearly, like, he's there, and he's like, eh, 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 rubbing his nose, and, like, he's blinking his eyes, and all of a sudden, one of his eyes is getting swollen because he's blowing his nose like an idiot. And um, that was the turning point. Like, you know, he wasn't stunned, but, like, he was bothered. And then, and then the next round, it comes out there, and that's when Usyk pop, pop, and Fury, you know, starts falling and flopping all over the place. And, again, that was, you know, it was just dramatic, you know what I mean? But at the end of it, it was close. I... 
I'm surprised that the judges gave Fury the last round. Maybe they thought he had landed more eye-catching punches, but Usyk outlanded him that round, and I thought outworked him too. And so yeah. it was one of those fights that at the end, I was convinced that Usyk had won. It was a really close fight, but when I heard split decision, I'm just like, ah, oh, shit, either it's going to be a draw or like, I don't know, you know? I'm just glad they got the right winner, in my opinion. It honestly, like we were, we were fairly lucky in the sense that we got a lot of stuff from the heavyweight championship fight. We got, you know, there was action. There was a fairly high level of skill. Uh, both guys were hurt. Almost got a knockout. Perhaps almost should have gotten a knockout. A little bit of controversy then. You know, we pretty much had it all. We had the exotic fucking fight locale with the, you know, cousin of a potentially, you know, dictator. Whatever. You know, it's we had everything. It was almost almost Ollie Frazier. And I think I think when you got two such high IQ guys that dispense with it and are just kind of like, it's just going to be a, about our balls in this. That's a really interesting combination because these guys are so skilled and Fury has so much composure and intelligence and strategy in terms of how he implements his size and how he's done it differently from fight to fight. I mean, even in the trilogy with Wilder, which I think is something we need to talk about also is like the recency bias in terms of people coming away from this fight being Usyk is the greatest fighter of all time, which is basically what they're saying about Fury after beating the same guy three times who had no resume. Who who did Wilder beat again? Um, I, and I'm not saying this wasn't a really important fight and it wasn't superb, like in terms of what we saw and it wasn't important and really good for the sport. All of that's totally true. I think Usyk's amazing and I think Fury's amazing, but the recency bias on this, whenever we just see something, we just go, it must be the best ever. This guy is incredible. And it's like Usyk has 22 fights as a professional. He has 22 fights. Um, are, are you saying that Anthony Joshua is a better all-time heavyweight than like Ron Lyle would have been in this era? Or like Razor Ruddick would have been in this era. Like, I mean, you could put up any of the guys from the 1990s. Tommy Morrison. In ter did Tommy Morrison have a better resume than Deontay Wilder? Maybe. Like, it it's just like we're in this era, which is great. Like, that's what we have to work with. But it's just funny to me how we just dispense with the 1970s or what Joe Lewis did or any of these other guys, Marciano. Uh, and and just come away from just being like, it's the most important thing ever. Now, clearly there's a, an incentive with the people saying that, that they're marketing, you know, their own jobs and, and relevance and that kind of thing. But I thought it was a little weird, like just give, give a little time for some perspective here. And it was just right away, the most important event of all time, the most, he is the greatest fighter ever. And it's like, Usyk's great, but how, who, who does he have on his resume as a heavyweight? He's fought six times. And yeah. Joshua, who has Joshua lost to? You know, like the Ruiz fights, he did not look like an all-time great. He definitely did against Klitschko. But let's remember, Klitschko was a 41-year-old guy who was deeply faded from where he where he'd been at his peak. So it's just like the the resumes are important, not just who you fought, but when you fought them. Well, Eris and I. You know, at least not as regularly as we should be, but we are semi regularly talking about boxing history. And you know, I talk about the history and shit on the accounts and all that type of shit. But I mean, look, man, I'm not going to lie. I'm not, and I'm not dumb either. I try to make as much s sink in and as and absorb as, as I possibly can, but I can't, I can't, you know, think for other people. <laughs> I, I can't make them absorb it. But I mean, there is a recency bias and uh, a lot of people don't know about the accomplishments of those older heavyweights or older fighters or the meaning of them or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of um, a lot of kind of pondering and belly gazing about that type of shit. What I will agree with, however, when it comes to that kind of stuff is that there have been people like, for, for example, Cliff Rold, who's a guy I've known for a long, long time. Uh, talking about in the wake of this fight, talking about, look, uh, people have been talking about for years, probably a good 25 to 30 years now, maybe a little bit more. Look how big heavyweights are getting. They're unbeatable. The heavyweights this era, this size, this training and this type of stuff, blah, 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 with this size and all this type of shit. And I think that this is another fight that might kind of dispel that notion a little bit or at the very least kind of help prop up the notion that it's definitely far more about skill than size. 
And that, I mean, that's a, I'm not saying that, oh, well, you place Rocky Marciano, the brother, pra- place Rocky Marciano in like the middleweight division. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so let's not get carried away. But my point is more that like, if you have a smaller, good heavyweight, they could still get some shit done, which we saw Alexander Usyk do. I, I just to close out this point uh, is just to say, like, look at Lennox Lewis's resume, go to box rec, look at who he fought and when they, when he fought them. And a lot of those guys would have thrived in this era. And Lewis, in many cases, annihilated them, often when they were undefeated or certainly at their peak. Lewis was willing to fight anybody, and he fought, like, 12 of these guys. I mean, in terms of, like, Razor Ruddick, uh, Oliver McCall, like, like, he beat every man he faced as well. Like, he he had the kind of courage to come back against guys who knocked him out and embarrassed him and come back and, and annihilate them or humiliate them in the case of McCall, Morrison, Ray, Ray Mercer, Akinwande, I think would have been a better fighter in today's era than De- Deontay Wilder. For he example. was a good fighter. It was just was the end of that days. fight was so disgraceful that everybody hated him after that, yeah. but he was actually a good fighter. Yeah. Riddick Bowe wanted nothing to do with Lennox Lewis. That's how good Lennox Lewis looked. And like, I mean, think about how good Bowe was at his peak. Galata, Briggs, the Holyfield fights, which are horrible to watch, but I mean, like, still, he was the better the better man there. Michael Grant looked like a demon for a little bit, just fucking blew him out of the water. David Tua, again, probably would have done pretty well in this era. Hasim Rahman um, would have been very dangerous in this era. And then Vitaly Klitschko, who I think, if you put Klitschko against any other heavyweight alive, I think I would I would want Klitschko to defend my life. If my life was on the line against any heavyweight in history, I think Vitali would have been the hardest to beat personally. But and and he was willing to fight him and and completely came through fire to pull that fight out. I think it was like the closest he came to just being beaten. I think it's the only time he was ever down on the store card, scorecards in his career. So, you know, I wish there would have been a rematch there, but he was at the end of his career, but still gutted out a victory there. So just just to give a bit of pause on the Usyk praise, which he totally deserves for this achievement, Lewis, I think, his, just if we're going resume, it's not even close what Lewis was able to accomplish as a heavyweight compared to Usyk. Full respect to what Usyk's done here with two Joshua wins and a Fury, but come on, like a, a little perspective. Yeah. There, well, there isn't any. That's the problem. Is it, there's there's not enough of it. Um, but I mean, I I do have to say, like, not to get too down on Alexander Usyk's win either. Um, it, it's tough because I was just on the preview show. I was talking about my issues with Tyson Fury and his reign. Just to sum up, it wasn't very good because he presided over a not very good heavyweight division that he did not clean out, missed a whole bunch of opportunities to fight a number of different good fighters, especially who were on the way up, did not fight them at all. They kind of fought each other as much as they could, waiting for a Tyson Fury shot. So it's not a good title reign. Um, But that being said, he still was the champion. And until somebody knocks you off, you're the champion and nobody could. Um, and again, there were probably fighters who may have had a better chance than the fighters he fought, but nobody did. And Alexander Usyk stepped up and, uh, something that's notable for, for Usyk is in his three biggest fights, he took the short end of the stick financially, which you have to do. I mean, it's not like you can step in there and say like, give me all the money when you don't deserve it. And, but, and you're not the star, but he did, he stepped in there and said, whatever, give me whatever the fuck the purse is three different times and beat those fighters three different times. And if you want to talk about an old school mentality, look, there's a whole bunch of things about Usyk that I don't really like the kind of like the harping about the Jesus shit really makes me uncomfortable. Not just from Usyk, from anybody, any sort of religion type of harping makes me fucking feel weird. However, you know, I mean, the guy, the guy stepped up and did exactly what he said he was going to do and had an old school mentality, quote unquote, about it, where he said, I'm going to gamble on myself and look at him now. He was the undisputed cruiserweight champion, undisputed heavyweight champion was there's there's only Holyfield's done that. Right. So, I mean, that in and of itself is an ex- both of those separate things, extremely good accomplishments, add them together. Very unique. If he keeps on going and makes defenses, wow. I, I like, though, that if he's going to be pious and sanctimonious with the religious stuff, at least it's not like Fury doing it, who's also a racist 
very frequently spewing racism, spewing homophobia, and clearly just a lot of a lot, not a classy champion, like as was illustrated in the lead up to this fight with his dad. Like, I mean, resorting to stuff that's embarrassing for the sport, like bringing it down. Usyk does seem to be a class act. I don't particularly enjoy the religious stuff either. Like, I, I don't think it has a place. God chose me to beat you. Like, I, I don't want to hear that stuff. But but he does seem to be, I heard from a number of people after this win, it's nice to have a guy that you're not embarrassed to be the champion. He does, you know, when he talks about his father, when he talk about talks about what mo motivates him, doesn't resort to the kind of trash talking that Fury was in the lead up to this. That was it's just not good. It's just like it's it makes the sport look ridiculous very often. And and Usyk doesn't like Usyk seems like a brave, dignified person. And even even Fury saying like this was about the the judges bowing to the fact that he's fighting for a country. They feel sorry for him. I was going to ask you guys about Classic. that. Like, yeah. I mean, I, and I'm not, I don't want to ask about it in the sense that I want to give it a microphone because I think it's stupid and I don't really, you know, we don't need to get into the politics of that situation, but just in the sense of like, um, how, you know, this is not legit, Eris, right? <laughs> like fucking Fury is coming up and saying like, oh, it's because people love Ukraine. I don't get that feeling whatsoever. No, nah, he was just mad. I didn't even take offense to it because he's literally just mad. Yeah, and throwing what a, a shitty thing, thing to say. Like, Absolute shitty thing to say. He just, he was just mad about it. Yeah, absolutely. And anyone saying that he was like being classy after the fight or whatever. Yeah, I saw a bunch of people say that. Really, and not really. When you're making comments like that, it's clearly showing that you're salty. Oh, I didn't, you know, he was being, he was trying to be the best he could instead of absolutely going insane, having his dad go insane or whatever, but he still had to get his barbs in. That's all that was. It's just him throwing salt on it because he was pissed off that he lost that fight. And that was on him. He clearly lost it. He shouldn't have got that split decision. He shouldn't have had a judge score for him, in my opinion. Right. And he was lucky enough that it was 114-113 because, honestly, Usyk probably should have won by a couple of more points than that. But that being said, yeah, I don't know, it's just Fury being salty. That's all that was, you know what I mean? But, like, to touch really quick on the other thing, too, Yeah, yeah. the historical shit is that, like, I'm not going to try to place him because he's still active. You know what I mean? I don't, well, maybe, I don't it's true. Might be retiring soon enough, but whatever. But like, I'll just say this about Usyk: instead of me trying to like rank him or say that he's one of the all-time greats or whatever, I think the best thing you can say about him is that he can compete in any era in heavyweight history. Absolutely, and, and he would be good at it too. Like, there's dudes in the '70s that he would have beat. There's dudes in the '80s and '90s that he would have beat. You know what I mean? Like, there was just all great fighters around there. But like, you can say for yourself nowadays, a first ballot Hall of Famer. He cleaned out a really tough cruiserweight division, probably the deepest one in the in, uh, in history at that point. Yep. And he was able to clean out, you know, the heavyweight division right now because like who's left for him really to beat? Like he beat Joshua, he beat Fury. Um, I would, obviously he would beat Parker if they fought. And like, um, you know, I can't really think of, until there's like a couple of guys on the horizon, I guess, as contenders, who knows if Lustig is even still going to be hanging around for that. But I would, again, I would just say that he competes well in any era in history. And I think that speaks great enough. <laughs> speaks great enough for him in that sense and that's the sober thing to say like that's all you need to say of course he's done enough he's achieved amazing things in the sport as a cruiserweight and as a heavyweight he did it fearlessly and and i also want to just add with fury like whining about my corner told me that i was ahead i didn't think i needed to to really fight as hard as i could have that's why i was showboating i was showing you i was so confident that i was winning all of that bullshit <laughs> fury was i mean rather Usyk was risking losing at any moment from some of those uppercuts he tasted in order to guarantee that he would win he never has an excuse for for two seconds of any fight he is going a hundred percent pressure on a guy that even a deontay wilder with all of his weaponry you know with just dynamite in both fists was totally unwilling to do what Usyk was doing the entire fight with way more physical disadvantages like that straight up his willpower and his courage and his confidence and desire to win he was never surviving Wilder survived a lot in those trilogies I think he lost every round that he didn't score a knockdown but but I think it's it's telling of Fury that I think Fury knows he lost to the better man. And I don't think he's ever felt that before, that he was in the ring with somebody that was actually better than he was in terms of more character. And I think Fury has tremendous character in the ring. Like, it's amazing what he came back from. 
But there was something about even the lead up to this fight where I think Fury couldn't shake Usyk because he was aware Usyk's probably seen a lot more dark things than Fury ever has. And Fury likes to pride himself that I've seen these things that nobody can, like where I came from to be here, I was born and I almost died, all of that. Usyk, Usyk chooses to go back into that fire in the Ukraine in terms of enlisting and like the defense uh, of the military and that kind of thing. He does it willfully. Yeah, that's know, what I said on the preview was that yeah. like, you know, it's kind of like a that scenario where you have a, a crazy person, but then they meet a real crazy person and they find out they were just acting like they weren't actually crazy. And oh, it. shit, you know, and that's kind of what it seemed like to me when obviously I had no I still picked Fury. I thought he'd win. But to me, that's kind of what I saw from Fury was that like he was like, look at this little guy. But then the little guy is just looking up at him, look at his chops. And he's like, oh, shit. It, it reminded oh, me of Roy Jones all the time in the, in the lead up to it. He did look frazzled. Yeah. I was just going to say what Roy Jones told me one time when he first was fighting in the amateurs with people from different parts of the country and met a lot of people from inner cities, which was like, oh, my God, they're the scariest people. What he discovered was they were the people the most afraid. They were afraid of everything. They were afraid of the dark. They were afraid of spiders. They were afraid of food. They were just, and he was just like, whoa, like I actually coming from the country where if something doesn't make food, you fucking kill it. Like, like, I mean. Yeah, a lot of people forget he's a bumpkin. A total bumpkin. Like, I mean, uh, Pensacola is no joke. <laughs> like, you go up to those parts, it's a military town. And if you're not employed by the military, you're probably in line at the methadone clinic at best. Like, I mean, it was one of the harshest places I've seen in terms of a lot of struggle there. And, um, and what he went through in order to become the guy that he did. I mean, he, he made a point to say, they say I'm the most talented ever. I worked harder than anybody else. That's how I got to where I was. But he was really taken aback by these inner city fighters um, who had such a reputation for being intimidating were actually the most intimidated people that he he dealt with in boxing. And I think Fury faced a little of that with Usyk. Usyk has a look in his eyes like, He's been through a lot more than I think Fury has. And, and you're right. I think Fury's playing a role, and he plays it very well um, in terms of selling fights and intimidating fighters. It's like Mike Tyson. The moment Mike Tyson faced anybody that was willing to come forward against him, Tyson never won a fight that he took a, a, a step backwards. He never, he never came out of the fire to win ever. And, and meeting somebody who has more character and doesn't need to resort to that kind of stuff um, – can it, it tests you and i think it tested fury in a way that even at the end of the fight he was looking for excuses to try to justify why he just didn't want to face it and put himself in more danger and and i think eris is absolutely right that nose got bloody he could be hurt he became a different fighter he became a totally different fighter when Usyk got hurt he did not become a different fighter it didn't make any difference to him that was that the contrast. I do think you both have a really good point. The contrast of what happened when they both got hurt and what they did afterward is it, it's a serious, you know what I mean? Like you could see it because you could see that like basically just kind of recapping the, the general, you know, flow of the fight, at least how I saw it. Uh, Usyk won on my car the first three rounds to the point where I was kind of like, you know, what is Fury doing? Like, this fool's giving away this fight. What is the fuck is he doing? Three rounds is a little too much. And it I did wind up being, one. it did wind up being too much. Um, I thought that he was, he was kind of lashing out and he was doing okay. Like, he was landing flashy shots, but Usyk was just money in the bank, dude, uh, to the body. And then all of a sudden, Fury kind of adjusted, and it looked like Usyk was reaching. And I was like, "Oh shit, he's buying on the, he's biting the feints." Mm -hmm. You know, Fury's doing the shit where he's dancing around, he's feinting him, he's fucking around and jabbing and shit. And I was like, "God oh, damn it!" And then by like what was it like round uh, six or so, round five or six, Usyk went back to his corner, and you could see him like blah, 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 doing that shit in his corner. Like he he looked shook, and I was like, "Oh man, if he got hurt by Fury, this could be bad." And Bren, you were talking about the uppercuts he was landing. I mean, they there was like almost no weight behind them, and they're like the most awkward, gangly looking. But they yeah. hit you, and it's still fucking two hundred and sixty pounds, you know. And so, yeah. it reminds me like we, uh, Eris, we were talking about Jess Willard and his shitty technique, and this fool's just fucking like can't even break an egg. But that's still two hundred seventy pounds that can't break an egg punching you. I'm sure it hurts. But I mean, they suspected that Usyk had a broken jaw, and they thought it was. That's what somebody area. said. Landed like, and you see it. He was, that was a hard shot. Like it wasn't, again, the torque on it wasn't amazing, but 
he landed it and you saw Usyk head visibly rock back and he had to take some steps back from it like he got his shit rocked a couple times he was he kind of had to yeah you know he, he had to step back off the shit sit my ass down you know Tangerine chronic fucked up now that's what Shit's- i was yeah i mean when you you can see when he throws the uppercut that his arm is moving at a different speed than his body the arm is not connected to his body that's what i mean it's like in the sense of you're supposed to punch with, from your feet up so it, so you're tr- you're pulling it over he's not pulling over the punches yeah his body is falling. The body jiggles fist. after the arm. Yeah, well, that too. But but I just mean in terms of his body is following the fist. The fist is driving the punch. So there's not the weight behind it. He's not committing to those punches. And a lot of that is because he's not throwing it coming forward. He's either throwing it standing or he takes a step back. But his weight is not coming through the punches. And yeah. it's really weird because clearly when he does step forward, he's devastating. Like to to have guys on the end of his jab and he comes over with that right hand with that gigantic 84 inch reach advantage. I mean, he utilized it the best he could. But I, I, I like you guys. I mean, sorry, I don't know if Eris scored it like like you did, Patrick, in terms of three nothing Usyk. But like there, like Eddie Hearn at the end of this fight was scoring a lot more for Fury that I, I don't know where he was getting those scores from. Well, and I I wasn't a massive fan of the commentating either but but i also i'm not a massive fan of DAZN's overall production and what they do chris mannix bleh, you know oh, all I these fools him. i love him he's my favorite person dying dying inside just hearing <laughs> somebody say that in jest it's yeah it's their entire i todd grisham is like not serious about anything at all and he was like lobbing jokes the entire fight card including the main event at oh, these British, so. at like Darren Barker and shit, and they were ignoring him, like not even responding to a word he was saying. It was the it was embarrassing to have like a heavyweight championship fight called like this. I'll just put it out there, like I'll say whatever. Anyway, point is that was not good, and I didn't like the way that they were they were probably a bit too complimentary to Fury in a number of different points. And and on top of that, like I was saying, they with the body work, they weren't really calling the body work quite as much as they should have been because yeah some of those were taps some of them were not i just don't want to hear about fucking fan duel from manix that's what i get so tired <laughs> with just shut the fuck up you're a commentator you're making good money you do basketball as well oh, i'm not gonna bet on this fight oh if i would have known that from this fighter how i would have bet this just shut the fuck so up about fan duel like this gambling stuff it's just it's so ugly to what me what does his excellency think about this you know what i'm saying that's what we need yeah to- <laughs> well, I think I think my tonsils are too busy sucking his dick. Like, I mean, like it's, no, I I that whole stuff too. I just find disgusting. Like, Tom Hauser told me he wrote a bit about how His Excellency is going to really be in charge. He wrote this for the Guardian in terms of um, PED testing, just because they have the money to look after it. The immediate response from His Excellency: Thank you, Mr. Hauser, on Twitter. We, we really look forward to your insights in improving the situation Then offers him a private uh, first class ticket to fly over to discuss it further. And well, I was like, Tom, you know, this Khashoggi thing, you know, I kind of like you as a non chopped up person, like maybe morally, this might be not the best way to go sort of thing, but that's how they operate. And I, there's a, the sport washing element of this. I, I do find fucking gross. They, well, I'll just put it like this. Eris and I have done shows about, uh, like, you know, like boxing history wise about entities who very quickly realize that boxing is ripe for the picking when it comes to if you just have a bundle of cash. Absolutely. If you just, wherever it came from, wherever it fucking came from, even if it's not real, yeah, because that's been the case a number of times. Fake money. Cruise on in, throw money at the situation, and you'll make shit happen in boxing. That's what people don't understand. And that's what they're seeing in real time. They're just, there's enough of a veneer. There's enough of a window dressing that they don't see it as that. They don't see it as sports washing. They just see this dude coming in and going, wow, he wants fucking Canelo to fight Terrence Crawford. Let's fucking make this guy happen, you know. And so I understand that from a fan perspective, if somebody's making some shit happen, who cares who they are, you know, but yeah, from a, from a journalistic perspective, from a, you know, worrying for your life perspective, it's, it's, it's a concern. (laughs) It's a concern. 
you're just co-signing on some. I mean, I mean, the thrill in Manila is the same situation. Like it's a horrendous humanitarian situation. Same thing with the rumble in the jungle. A lot of people look past it. I'm just saying it's an element that should be brought up. It's sort of like, you know, when you see celebrities that have a history of there's there's spousal abuse or assault or something like that. Like often it's like, don't bring that up. It's unpleasant to to bring that up. I I don't know. I think if you don't bring it up, it, it's not part of their legacy. It's part of the reason why it keeps happening. And and I, I do think bringing it up with this stuff, not as the whole story, but just as part of the story is is it was it's just a little weird that that with the highest bidder, we just look the other way. And there's some horrendous. <laughs> this is not like we're we're cherry picking data to be harsh on on their humanitarian record. Like it's appalling over there. And everything you're seeing that's so glittering and beautiful, who built it? Look into that shit if you're curious. Well, and Eric, I, I have a question for you about like, not about the necessarily the morality or the ethics of this, but just like, where is this going to go? You know what I'm saying? Like how, how much longer could this go? Like how much longer could they kind of just like keep throwing money? Like, and from a fan perspective, you, you're hoping that it's forever, right? Um, yeah, it's it's interesting in the sense that, like, boxing, again, to kind of touch on what y'all said, there's no morals here, you know what I mean? Anyone's involved in it, anyone can get involved in it. As long as we have money and some personality, people will be there to at least, you know, be open to your ideas before they try to screw you over. But with a guy like this coming in here with all that money, regardless of, you know, how ethical it is and where it comes from, um... People are just going to be open to it. This is like the type of stuff that boxers have dreamed of, you know what I mean? Let alone fans in terms of like paychecks and all that. So that's why they're so open and happy to uh to go there. Oh, I want a Saudi bag. That's what, you know. And I don't know how long this type of stuff can last. Like, who knows? You know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. He's seen, if anything, this this guy um seems like he has plans of not just you know, making the biggest fights, but trying to like take over the whole sport in general in almost all aspects. He was over there yelling about box wreck the other day. Remember that? Um, <laughs> and they were pound for pound on this. Poor Gray. Getting yeah, God. <laughs> Protect Gray with your life. Yeah, right. And um, and now uh, what Brent just said about, you know, PDs and Tom Hauser and all this other shit. Like, he's clearly trying to trying to be the person that'd be like, I want to be involved in this. I want to be involved in that. I want to fix this. I want to do this. And it's all kind of like at the whim of his preferences you know what i mean and i don't know a lot of people out there too it seemed like they just want to sip the kool-aid of this dude look how and everybody goes there calling him his excellency oh you know want to be buddies with him he's doing this and and he that lineup of fighters remember a couple months ago i remember what fire fight it was but remember they took that photo and it was like every fighter alive that we love sure. and respect and we were like whoa shit <laughs> but what else are they doing i mean it's as you say it's right for it because i mean the history of this sport in terms of guys who retire and go off in the sunset not not great i mean this is not a, a sport where you look for happy endings with any of the great characters joe frazier sleeping in his gym you know in a in a tough area of philly and stuff like that versus ali being one of the exceptions at least at least economically by selling his name but physically, like, you know, Ali becomes very popular the moment he can't talk. <laughs> you know, like, it, it, it's he becomes sort of like a useful avatar. I just think, yeah, it is really ripe for people. Like, this is just changing their couch in terms of buying the sport. And as Eris says, there's no barrier to entry in this sport. Don King can kill two people. He can shoot one. He can stomp another on the head for fucking 50 bucks or whatever it was. And immediately, if he got Ali... Suddenly he's in the sport and he's, you know, P.T. Barnum. There's no other sport where you can do that. You know, a lot of people just don't realize that, that there's just like no governing body. There's no, you know, it, it's it, it's so unlike every other sport where we paywall all of our best stuff. I mean, until Jake Paul, Mike Tyson, the greatest sporting event of all time changes that with Netflix. <laughs> It's it's absolutely insane, but I don't you know I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon because like mm. his his box um the fighters at least the majority of the fighters out there are all very excited to work with him. Um, promoters are there like you know trying to babble him too, ho hoping that they're gonna try to get some kind of gig out of it. I mean he works with Frank Ro uh, Warren predominantly now. He's working with uh, uh what's his name, um Hearn, 
and um, looks like he's starting to do a little bit of business with PBC, right? So there's all this stuff out there. And as long as everyone wants to keep working with him and trying to make these fights, then I mean, you know, it is, it's here to stay. Like Saudi Arabia, they're out there. They're not just messing with boxing. I mean, they're over there trying to take over the whole sporting world. Like they were over there, they fucking won golf. They got soccer, um, auto racing, yeah, racing, yeah, yeah, like all these different things. And this is just their personal playground. You know what I mean? So, and, and this has always been done. I mean, if Julius Caesar, you had five hundred years of democracy, and he was like, "How do I? How do I take over as a dictator?" The first thing he did was go after the Coliseum and put on the best show that's ever been put on there. It's the first place he went. And within, I think, 14 years, he took it over as a dictator for life. Like, he understood the masses and populism. If you go after what distracts them from a shitty situation, it's the most effective way to just win their vote. And and you're right. Like, who in the sport is going to stand up for a principle? Good luck. Good luck. It's certainly not going to be Eddie Hearn. It's certainly not going to be any of these fighters who just... There, there. The only immoral thing is not making money. That's the I mean, only there's no, there's no principle in boxing. The last guy, you know, if you think about it, if you really want to go back, you know, anyone who has the stands on morals and values almost got killed back in the day. Let alone, you know, you just getting again ostracized from the sport. You know, I'm pretty sure Ray Arso back uh, would rather get you know um, yelled at on Twitter than taking a lead pipe to the head for trying to stand up for what was wrong, for what was morally right in the sport back in the you know in the 50s or whenever it was. He got knocked out of it. So it's like. Um, yeah, it's no one's trying to do anything. You know what I mean? You don't want to be that person <laughs> because no. you're not making money. So what we're trying to say, your excellency, is that we are obligated to say these things on this show, but we will still accept the money is what we're trying to say. No problem. See, it did it again. Why did it do this? I don't under Zoom. What the fuck are you doing? What the fuck? Well, that wasn't that wasn't Zoom. That was his excellency. Oh, I shit. He's listening. He, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a sign. That's a yeah, sign. No. No, of course he is, because I think what he's trying to say is, how did you guys feel about Daniel Kinahan and the whole Fury situation? Is this not better? Are it's, you not entertained? You know, it's funny you bring that up, too, because I guess that would be, I guess, to respond to Eris and what we were just talking about, if, whether or not this could keep going or how long could keep going is that like. How long is this? Is the State Department going to be okay with it? Because I mean, that's what stopped it with Kinahan was, you know, he was there was nobody overseas going to really do anything, really, and so and somebody walked into a fucking way in in Dublin, Dublin with an AK. Jesus Christ! Can you imagine? If the, I mean, well, no, I can't imagine that happening in America. <laughs> I can definitely imagine that happening in America, but uh, it's not really that funny. It's sad, but nonetheless. Crazy. The the State Department is the one who stepped in and stopped that, and it was ba and on top of that, they're not even really stopping it anymore because Tyson Fury and all these fools can move freely to the U.S. now. They they're not really mon or they're probably monitoring it, but they're not stopping it. So I don't know, man. I don't know. I guess it would be up to somebody, an entity like that, to really stop it, and I don't really see that happening. Well, and, and to your to your point, I mean, when Floyd Mayweather was in jail, I think for beating one of the women he beat up. They let him out in order to have a fight based exclusively on the economic impact that that fight would have on Las Vegas, which was economically depressed. So, yeah, don't in any way pretend like our government is above like the economic concerns of this and has like no moral courage whatsoever, you know, and, and totally treating some people in a special way versus others. Yeah, that was when Floyd wrote his letters from Clark County Jail manifesto where he compared himself to Muhammad Ali. Well, I mean, Nelson Mandela is in a trial about four miles from here, according to him, from from where I am in New York City. So, you know, how does that stand out? It's an interesting guy. Very yeah. interesting guy. So circling. He, he was in Vegas when Tupac got shot <laughs> and then like, people called him out on it. And he was like, actually, I didn't say that. I said this. <laughs> It's yeah, it's a cousin Roy situation all over. Yeah, again. he was like, I didn't say I was. I saw Tupac get shot. I said, I said I was living in Vegas at that. Yes, time. I saw it in a newspaper. Yeah, he has <laughs> some he blew a shot. I saw a video. I'm just glad the Heat finally got off Patrick for that that Tupac hit. Thank goodness. And I was worried. I mean, yeah, I, I've been hiding in you know, circling back to this heavyweight situation. Hey, I mean, two thing. Like, where did it come from? I'll tell you, Tupac. Tupac, you know, Tupac got murked on a night of the heavyweight championship too. So easy segue, easy segue right back to this heavyweight business. Okay. Now I was, now I made it awkward, but nonetheless, 
it sounds like they're going to probably have a rematch. Uh, I mean, Absolutely they should. I get it. it. I have no problem with it in the sense that it was a good fight. It was entertaining. The event itself, you know, it makes sense. Like it probably made a bunch of money for a whole bunch of people um, controlled by the Saudis, of course, like we were just talking about. But it makes sense that they're going to have a rematch. I guess my only kind of issue is that it sounds like they're talking about having a rematch in like fucking October, which I guess makes sense because uh, what uh, Ramadan is September. Well, and the co-main event, obviously, with Logan Paul Tyson, I think it's going to be massive. Yeah, I, I just I don't like the whole idea of that much time between the fights, I guess. But I've logistically, I, I guess it makes sense. But I mean, what? I don't know. I don't know. That's the day before my birthday. Apparently, it's supposed to happen. Well, I spoke to his excellency, and he said that was a major consideration for the October proposal <laughs> rematch. It's going to be some fireworks in the background popping up any second. As long I mean, as you it's, just stop it's, talking. it's interesting, though, because, like, where else can either one of these guys go at this moment? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'd love to see Fury fight uh, Josh, Joshua finally. And I still think that fight may happen one day, you know, considering anything. But, like, Usyk, I mean, there's nowhere else for Usyk to go except to have a Fury rematch, considering, like, you know, the greatness of that first fight and... The closeness of it, even though I think there was a clear winner, but just the way the judges had and all that, Fury is going to be bowling, you know, up and down until this rematch about how he should have won this fight and all kinds of other bullshit. So it is what it is, you know what I mean? And um, who knows? I just, like Pat said, though, it is a little bit of time until then, and um, a lot of things can happen until then. You know, Fury has a tendency to get injured. Usyk is not getting any younger. He gets injured sometimes. And... You know the the time period from then until then. I mean, we'll see. I don't. I don't. You know, after that fight, if Usyk beats him again, I could see him potentially retiring. If if Fury loses again, I can't picture him. A dude with that type of the way the way his mental work is and stuff like that. I'm not sure he can handle losing twice to the same dude at one. You know. So who knows? It's it's going to be interesting, but there's a little bit nowhere else for those guys to go except to fight each other in a rematch i can't see either one of them taking an interim fight and not only that i just wouldn't be worth it for them to do that considering everything i think that's a great point that where where can Usyk go from here other than a rematch yeah like nothing nothing else really makes sense i mean i, I mean I, like there there are fighters i'm sure that we would all like to see him be fine in, but in you can't theory fight. It. but you yeah. Can't, yeah there's no there's no surpassing beating this guy who's a champion who's undefeated like i think really you're just there's nowhere to go but down in terms of legacy if that's a concern for him i mean this is a guy who's fought 350 amateur fights mm -hmm. like apart from 11 year professional career he's fought 372 times as an amateur and as a professional he's had a long career and and he also is somebody that I do not think is getting artificially enhanced, like even him being in shape for this. He's not ripped like Holyfield used to get ripped or still gets ripped. I mean, you can see when Holyfield <laughs> comes out of retirement, he still looks more jacked than Usyk did going into this fight. So I I don't know. I mean, I would still like to see Wilder and Joshua. I think that would just be a, a really exciting, fun fight. I, it's not necessarily of heavyweight importance any longer, but. But this was an era of really fun heavyweights to see them match up. And we got a, a handful, but we certainly missed out on a lot when they should have happened, I think. I, I wonder if they can make up for that because they would be so lucrative still, right? I mean, there's still a bunch of combinations in there and possible rematches. But but this particular Fury and Usyk having the rematch is sort of disruptive from putting together more fun matches to happen, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of other heavyweights out there. Like you said, Wilder and uh, Joshua is still a great fight to make, and I would yeah. love to watch that. Um, Wilder makes for good fights with anybody, even though he looks so lackluster in his last fight, but the power factor is still there. I'm really looking forward to his fight with Zhang because I don't think that's going the distance. Um, Zhang makes for fun fights. You know, you could take um, uh, the kid, um, Anderson there, big baby Anderson, even though he's clearly immature and got some out of the ring issues he needs to work on um if he but he has the talent and if he's trying to be fast track then you know there's available fights right there from as well you know what i mean like i would love to see him in the mix with a guy like parker or a wild or a zang or or even um fury eventually who knows you know so like 
mix and match all these guys, there's going to be a lot of um, good fights to be made in this division. Like, it's not a bad division at this moment um, compared to, like, I don't know, say, like, the Klitschko era or something like that. But I just don't see a guy like Usyk hanging around to make multiple defenses like a Lennox Lewis or a Larry Holmes or one of those guys that or even Wilder, for example, who made, like, 10 defenses of his belt before he lost it to Fury. Like, you know what I mean? I just don't see that. Like, he's already in his mid-30s. He's accomplished everything he has that he's wanted to and yeah after this rematch i don't know if he's going to be hanging around because there's like some young lung, uh, hungry lion that he feels that he needs to like you know settle down before he rides off to the sunset you know what i mean and, and can i ask you guys because i mean when we're talking about like how good is he in terms of resume or how good he, would he be against another guy what what jumps out to me about Usyk is just is he the most complete heavyweight that we've ever seen like, what is his weakness? Because I don't really see it. He's not a great puncher, necessarily. He's not the fastest puncher. But just overall, is he the most complete heavyweight that we've kind of seen? I still say Ali is, man. Maybe I'm being a weird bias, but, like, prime Ali is oh, just still... Good guy to be biased you know, about. <laughs> like, it's... it's and, You know, I think Ali is still the most complete fighter I've ever seen that heavyweight. You know what I mean? Or close to it. Like, it was just something different about him but Usyk for all of his skill and everything like that he certainly stacks up there like he's just he's a great fighter just an all-around great fighter he could take him he could take a big punch he his skill work is absolutely beautiful and everything that he does um he doesn't necessarily have one punch knockout power but he clearly punches hard enough to really rock the shit out of you or almost knock you out and he has a great gas tank like he's just one of those guys that like has he he has remarkable, remarkable recuperative powers as well. Like we haven't seen him get dropped in anything like really badly by I me. Mean, look how bad he was taking those body shots again, beat up by Fury in those middle bounds. A lot of guys would have just ended up sucking it in and going down, either quitting or just getting beat down or, you know, whatever it may be. And he just took it in, adjusted and brought it to another level in that next round and was able to come through that. Most guys won't be able to do that. So you add all those things up and... Yeah, Usyk is remarkable. You know what I mean? Definitely stacks up there as just being one of the more complete fighters this um the division has ever seen, if not the sport. I would just push back with the Ali thing because I think in terms of the, the one area where I don't think Ali measures up to Usyk, even though I think he's much faster, probably more more athletic, more talented in, in, in some of those departments, not as disciplined. Ali oh, has yeah, a lot of course. Ali has a lot of fights he came in not in shape, including the first Frazier fight. It was it was an element for him that he struggled with. It's, it seems like his diet was was a bit of an issue. Gain weight, especially later on in his second career yeah. too. Came in there Absolutely. like shit against Jimmy Young and a bunch of others. He felt inferior to, but like, um, but if he was when, when he put it together, you know what I mean? That's what I'm no, saying. No, no, when he put it together, it's no question. Yeah, but but, just, things, but yeah. you have to give Usyk credit, just like I would give Floyd Mayweather credit. Mayweather always went in the absolute 100% that he could be in every sure. single fight. And and, he, and anybody else can say, oh, I didn't train probably whatever, like who I would have been, my potential is what you should judge. But in terms of preparation and discipline, Usyk is flawless. Ali was far from flawless. Like it was just, I think the one weakness is there were times he was like, I can annihilate Frazier in the thrill in Manila. I surely I can beat him in that that first fight. And there are many examples of that where it, it waned. You know, he had to be up for a fight, which I think is also true of Fury. Fury has to be up for a fight. If he's not, we saw what happened <laughs> in, in the last one. Um, yeah. you know, he can lose to somebody it's his, their first fight, even though he's a tremendous athlete. But that was really embarrassing to watch for the sport. Yeah, there's uh, an element of consistency. I think that Usyk does kind of have a bit of an advantage uh, over some of these other fighters we could talk about just in terms of execution. Um, obviously, he's 37, and there's a little bit of time left because he didn't reign as a cruiserweight champion for a long time or make a ton of defenses. He just won the heavyweight championship. So it's like, you know, uh, a fighter like Ali obviously has a lot of longevity on him. We saw a lot more of Ali than we've seen of Oleksandr Usyk. But that being said, um, I do think that, you know, people talk about fighters like Riddick Bowe in his prime where the window was very short, it was very narrow, but he could do it all. Uh, and that was that's kind of like what I see from Oleksandr Usyk. But 
I don't see nearly as much inside fighting. Like that's kind of where I see a Riddick bow or somebody like that having an advantage. However, Usyk also hasn't really had to do that nearly as much. Yeah. There's not nearly as much inside fighting allowed in this era. And it's not encouraged the same way. It's not taught the same way, et cetera, et cetera. Now you know I'm starting to sound like a crotchety old fucking history guy, but you know, it's it true. Just like it, the NBA, it changes. He looked really impressive, though. I'll say this. Not it wasn't like his inside work, but how he handled Fury on the inside. Yeah, Fury he pushed him off a couple times. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. He was trying to do all that leaning and putting his weight and doing all that bullshit that he does to guys like Usyk. And he just kind of changed the angle and was like, whoop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Usyk didn't allow him to get all that off on that. No, and, that's you know, true. Fury clearly was like struggling I mean, uh, at points with that, too, because that's one of his, you know, main things that he tries to do. So I'll give Usyk that. Like, yeah, I think he has a good inside game. He just hasn't really had to, you know, right. push that moment. Exactly. Well, and, and setting up the inside stuff, because if you go back and watch this, watch the way Usyk is determining where they're going to engage. He's always getting to the outside foot. And then suddenly you have Fury has to turn and be completely square in order to face him. And Usyk's at an angle where he has time to throw a punch before he can be hit. He does it over and over and over again, sets up traps. And Fury is really sophisticated. It's just he's out of position. And that's, that's not happening accidentally. That's totally Usyk's yep. game. That's why he's that able timing. to do the things he's doing. It's timing, it's strategy, it's conditioning, and we're, and it's the balls to, to take a risk to get caught with something, as he was getting caught with stuff, the body shots, the uppercuts, that kind of thing. But once he got hit with the uppercut and realized, ooh, what, what I'm doing with this game plan is not working, he makes an adjustment and is turning Fury over and over and over again as he's coming inside. It's not just they're squaring off it's finding an angle like it's it is the science of it that he's mastering and i guess to be fair too if i'm talking about like riddick bow or whatever put alexander Usyk in with that version of evander holyfield and i bet you we'd see Usyk do a lot more infighting so you know yeah. so it's it's fair to note that he hasn't gotten the same opportunity too but that being said yeah he did do some he did do some impressive stuff inside where he really avoided punishment from Tyson Fury inside and avoided that draping over him type of shit that he's done to pretty much everybody. Mm -hmm. It's a fun fight to rewatch. It's a really, it's really worthwhile to rewatch to appreciate even more what Usyk did. It wasn't just balls. Like it was a lot. He outthought Fury and he, he figured out ways to solve the problems and questions that Fury asked with his his height, his reach, all of his advantages. He figured out solutions to those problems. It was it was like, like I you can appreciate it a bit when you first watch it, but to go back and watch how they were set up, it, it it makes the achievement I think stand out even more. All right, so I got two stats to throw out there. Eris, I already I already said something to him about one of them. It's, it's mostly just because I thought it was hilarious. The first stat is that. Usyk is the second, right? The second ever Southpaw, oh, undisputed Southpaw. heavyweight champion. I mean, that's notable. Chris Bird was Southpaw, but he held, I think, two different titles at two different times or something like that. IBF, and so, WBO, yeah. He was right? Never, yeah. yeah, so it doesn't really count because he was not the lineal champion and blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, important. However, a stat. The second stat is that there have not been three consecutive white, undisputed, or lineal heavyweight champions since the 1930s. That's heavy. <laughs> That's crazy to me. I guess I don't really give a shit because I never would have even thought to look. I don't know. But then when I laid it all out and just kind of looked back and was like, wow. You know, this is a Shawshank Redemption moment. Because you point that out, it never occurred to me that that fact. And it's exactly like Morgan Freeman in a movie where his race is not mentioned once while they're in jail, or the fact that it was originally written with a white character in mind by Stephen King. And nobody's like, this was weird, or this was a, it just flows and nobody ever mentions it. So I didn't even think to look. Yeah. And then I a, saw it and I was kind of just like, whoa, that's kind of fucking crazy. It never occurred I to don't me give that. a fuck either way. I just think it's a crazy stat. I mean, it really is when you think about it. The 30s, well, my dad is turning 90 this year, and he was born in 34, so keep that in perspective. <laughs> Your dad was born in 1934? Yeah. Yep. Whoa. How old was he when he had you? 50. 
50 god damn okay we're yeah. thinking about <laughs> that's yeah. that's the cape verdean community is strong yeah. yeah, that's an achievement in and of itself. That should be mentioned with this Usyk championship. <laughs> yeah, straight yeah. up. Yeah, and next week, well, no, in two weeks. Uh, his birthday's in two weeks at the end of the month. That's like oh, the yeah. shooter in the pina colada, like where you get the shot inside of the cocktail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, like like I said, I don't give a fuck about and black, white, heavyweight challenge. I don't give a fuck oh, about no, any no, of that, but no, I just no, thought it was I'm, pretty crazy. So that would be what then? Uh... Tunny, Dempsey. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, Tunny, uh, Tunny, um, Sharky, Schmeling, um, Marciano, Car- Carnera. So that's like four in a row right there. So right, and then um, well, Braddock. yeah, there was a oh yeah, Baron Braddock. Well, so, yeah, there was from from Jack Johnson to Joe Lewis was all just white heavyweight champions, yeah. and I well, we pretty much know why, and before that, none. But sure. that was for racism, just to make sure people know that I'm not pointing this out because I'm like, yay! But I'm, you know, oh, saying what the oh, fuck it is. Yeah. But nonetheless, yeah, when Joe Lewis kind of rebroke the mold or whatever, was, shit was over. I mean, it was a dark time, man. There was a lot of like we always talked about the great white hopes are such a weird term, but like especially nowadays because when you think about the context of it and when it came from back in the day, it's just like it wasn't a good thing. You know what I mean? Because it was mostly like a racism thing. Oh, we need a great white hope. And now we hear some like some idiot commentator refer to some guy like that, and you're like, no. Yeah, yeah, like stop that. And most of the fighters that were referred to that were usually like, oh, I don't want to be called, especially poor Jerry Cooney, you know what I mean, who <laughs> had the most ridiculous managers and everyone else, including Don King and everyone trying to force that shit on him. He's just kind of like, I just like fight. <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, you know, they've had a few, there's been a few good fighters. I Like, obviously, Jerry Corey, if he was born in a different era, certainly could have been a heavyweight champion at one point or another. But, like, you know, and then you think of others, like, well, Dwayne Bobbick. <laughs> and it's like, eh. But it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting stat. It's just one of those guys that now, I mean, like, Usyk is just, is just the man. Like, it doesn't matter what it is or anything like that like that dude is just legitimately the man and it's funny too that like the to veer off really quick a lot of people were mentioning oh you got to put him on pound for pound now he has to be in the discussion no he doesn't all right it's always been known that pound for pound never really has to include the heavyweight champion like the heavyweight champion is the heavyweight champ especially if he's the undisputed guy like that dude's the king of the world right there all right the fuck does he need pound for pound for like we all know that Usyk is one of the best in the world yeah but it's not necessary because you could just necessary. you're it's assumed you could beat everybody exactly and like you know it was always that title's always been designated i think the only time you know a heavyweight champion was pound for pound number one is when excuse me i probably mike tyson was at the top of the list when they first were like doing those lists in the late 80s you know like ring magazine and ko and stuff like that but other than then no you know he's he's just the man that's how it should be what what do you guys think the racial breakdown would be of all the champions across the sport what would your what would your guess be? Oh God, I don't know. Today in, in today, but I have no idea. Just in in general in history, <laughs> it's like oh, as well, diverse like, as like you know as you can get right now in the sporting, which is pretty awesome. But I mean, I have no idea who, and like in terms of countries or anything like that, who's like the other. Yeah, I'd just be curious. Just, because like anecdotally, I would say like the sport now is driven predominantly. But it's probably probably a slight majority Latino fan base for the sport and then African-American. And then I think there's been a migration of whites toward the UFC, where it definitely seems predominant. Their fan base is white in a way that boxing isn't. It's just I'm not saying I I know what this means or I'm trying to make an argument. I'm just curious about it's just like like the NBA. I'm just looking at it is 70 percent African-American, 17 and a half percent white, 82 and a half percent people of color. And it, I've never heard that about sports. Like, I don't know what it is in the NFL. I I would presume African-American is the majority in the NFL. I would also presume people of color are predominantly the champions in boxing. Does that sound right to you guys? Especially now? Yeah. Yeah, now. I'm speaking now. I mean, oh, I think yeah. that there's probably a point, my guess would be in like sometime like 1920s-ish or something like that would be probably before that point, there was a lot of white dudes. And then after that point, it stopped 
kind of, you know, being that much of the case. But there's a lot of reasons for that and not necessarily just racism or whatever, but a lot of socioeconomic reasons for it. For instance, a shitload of immigrants coming from all over the place into the U.S. and the U.S. Absolutely. becoming the, a boxing hub. It's, you know, in because you can call it an international sport or a global sport, and it is, but it's obviously more popular in some places than others. And so, you know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons for that. But yeah, I would say that especially now, um, yeah, I, I, you don't really see a whole lot. I, I think the most of the white champions you're seeing are from like Eastern Europe and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and not a whole lot right. of white Americans, that's for sure. Yeah, that's and you're right. All the Ellis Island you know, like that time of those guys coming over, Italian, Irish, Jewish, like like it was not uncommon to see those guys fighting all the time. And then suddenly... Especially in the 1930s, yeah. Especially in the 1930s. And then as they move up, out, out, out of that socioeconomic desperation, you don't have to go into boxing. Most people don't go into boxing as a rule. I mean, and also too, like, you know, when me and Pat were talking about this on the show, you got... All the when like a lot of other countries start picking up as quickly, you know, catching up to America in terms of like, you know, the popularity of the sport and stuff like that. Sure. And, then, and, you know, the lighter white fighters coming in and stuff like that. You got like a lot of it, it just became an international sport, especially like I, I always like to say the stat because it's fascinating to me. In 1976, when people always talk about, oh, you know, we need an American heavyweight champion or we need that. They weren't saying this back then. I'm just saying in general how people will be talking today. We need more American fighters. We need this, blah, 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 blah. And at one point in 1976, there was only one American champion in the entire sport of boxing, and that was Ali. Every other division was filled with uh, was champions from other countries. Right. So it's like, you know, that's it's crazy. And, well, you know, I don't think that's ever happened since then. But, like, you know, in, in that, like, particular time like that. But, I mean, like, that just shows you just the the way the sport has evolved over, like, in, in terms of, like, all that, you know? But, but and, sir, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. And so it, it it's, yeah, I don't it, It's tough to think. Like, yeah, there's been white champions since then. And they've been, you know, increasingly popular. Like, think of a guy like Joey Gamash, for instance, and how popular he was in Maine. You know what I mean? Like, that dude was... That he was the most popular fighter. I mean, he was one of the most popular people in the entire state, let alone being a fighter at that time. Couldn't walk down blocks without getting mobbed. Uh, Tony Lopez was huge in Sacramento. You know, um, was it Sacramento he was mm -hmm. from? I think so, right? Yeah. Okay. And like, you know, things like that, but uh, it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's, you do, you, you do have to think, uh, think a little bit before, you know, when you start thinking about like actual champions and things. I don't know. I, and I was just going to say, I mean, 20 years since an American male won the Olympics, mm -hmm. I mean, country 340 million. That's kind of interesting. But but I think I think just on a bare bones level, like 11 years ago, I wrote about Eric Kelly training white collar boxers. And I was like, you know, when you look at this, how do you maintain a boxing gym in America anymore in terms of being financially solvent? You're certainly not teaching inner city kids in order to keep the lights on at your gym because you couldn't nope. afford it. Uh, I, I work out at the YMCA. It's 130 bucks a month to train there. And it's like, well, you got to market okay. to the MILFs, bro. You, or you don't survive because there's not seen any social value in getting kids off the street and, you know, helping them and offering that lifeline to them by using boxing as a means to, find discipline and support and surrogate family members and all that kind of stuff. Sounds great, but it doesn't make anybody any money. And so, those gyms are non-existent now. A lot of those gyms like Joe Frazier's gym or uh, how can they be as all these other gyms like in the inner cities like that, yep. they, they're gone. I mean, the boxing gyms I used to have in New Bedford when I was growing up in where I was like, cutting my teeth and getting my ass kicked all the time. Those yep. aren't around anymore. Um, but all those old independent gyms that are still around are taking a fucking bath, bro, yeah, or they're absolutely. relying on like GoFundMe's and shit. And and it's sad too because to to add to your point, it, it, if you go to Gleason's or if you go to, uh, I don't know if Mendy's is still open after the pandemic. You know, like all the like the popular gyms in the city, mm -hmm. right? And over here where you gotta pay exorbitant amounts that I can't afford to go to every month because it's just a wild price. And then you go and the place is packed absolutely packed but when you look it's not packed with actual fighters sure there's a few of them like lingering around but the majority yeah. of the people are it's just like any gym like yeah, people the majority selfies of people are and just, shit. you know yeah. and, and they're there taking uh workout classes like you said white collar you know like lawyers and this and that and uh hedge fund dorks and all these other people and you know and and others who just go there 
and they're just learning how to box, but they're not actually learning how to box. And that's their clientele. They're paying mad money to do that. And you can't train. Like, there's no room to go in the heavy bag. You can't go shadow box. You can't nothing. Everybody is just wrapped around there doing bag drills and doing other dumb shit. And I just annoys the hell out of me. <laughs> like, you know, I like to be in a gym. I grew up in a dirty ass gym where I had to like, you know, you go in the back and you go in one of those things. Like, it looked like Mickey's gym, but one of those old ones. Or my gym even looked like the one from Rocky Three. When yeah, he it's has not a display. It's, you're there to work, not fucking be on display. Absolutely. Yeah, and I still carry that mentality. When I'm in a boxing gym, don't talk to me. I straight up sit there and do my work, and I'm out in an hour. <laughs> or whatever it is. Like, you know, you just go there to do your business. Not sit there and take photos, like you said, and converse and blah, blah, and do bullshit pad work with people. But that's all you see. You know, it's stuff. No, and I mean, I mean, that's largely the reason I did that article about Eric Kelly. I pitched it, and I said, like... This is not about boxing. This is about instead of going to a dominatrix, all these white people are going to an African-American who tells them they're they're a piece of shit and that they're soft and that they can't exist as a man. I'm like, this dynamic is really weird. Imagine a doorman saying that to people who live upstairs in New York City. Imagine delivery people saying that because like I rented a little room in a place on the Upper West Side when I first moved to the city and I was like, everybody in this building is white. We're not, not African-American or Latino. We have doormen who are black and Latino who are coming in from Pennsylvania because it's the only job that you can get a fucking union and have protection for your kids, you know, have healthcare and all that kind of stuff without much of an education. But these are white lives that every person looking after that life is a person of color, cleaning their home, delivering their food, driving them where they're going. And then they go to the gym and they've got a guy telling them that they're a piece of shit. You know, for just being a lawyer or a sellout uh, trader kind of thing. And they loved it. Like I interviewed all of these white traders and they're just like, he's the only person who tells me how shitty I am. I love it. And I was like, this is a dominatrix. This is just a dominatrix. Fucking, you got the shame kink. Yeah, ex well, that's exactly what it is. It's like, finally, I get to feel powerless. It's so sexy. It's such a turn on. It was so bizarre. And they were just thrilled to tell me about it. And he and Kelly was so smart. He totally saw it, like what they were really paying for. It wasn't to get in shape. It was to finally have somebody just tell them what a piece of shit they were. And they loved him for it. So we've, so we've spent the last like 15 minutes kicking the whites while they're down. It's been great. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, no, we're but we're not. We're just we're talking about like a socioeconomic class, you know, like. I think that's no. I think it's an intelligent discussion. I just got to make a joke. No, it, but I just I, I just hadn't even thought of what you said. That's really interesting. It hadn't even occurred to me that Usyk is part of some continuum of of white champions. That's really, and I'm glad that nobody else has brought it up. You know, like uh, fucking, yeah, and that's why not bringing it up. That's one of the reasons why I haven't brought it up outright like that because it will be seized upon by people I don't want have I don't want any association with whatsoever, and that's not even my point in bringing it up. I just think that it's wild. It's crazy. It does say a lot about the uh, the economics of boxing and how attractive it is for different demographics and all those types of things. But those are you know those are those are tough discussions to have intelligently. I'm I'm not gonna lie. And and I mean they're I don't think they're that difficult for us. But in general, you know, you start allowing the public into those discussions, and it's it's dicey, pretty fucking dicey. But that being said. You know, uh, it does every single time. I'm trying to think the last time I want to say it was the Fury Wilder. The third fight was when it was a, you know, it was an entertaining fight. And we all were kind of like, fuck, we got to jump on and talk about that shit. And look again, we got Alexander Usyk putting it on with Tyson Fury. Great fight, ebbs and flows, hard punches landed, new undisputed heavyweight championship. And we're excited. You know, we're kind of back on this and saying, we got to talk some shit here. And I think that that's also, Eris, what you were talking about earlier, just the the effect of heavyweight boxing. And when it's great, it's great. You know, when that shit is top notch, it's, it's pretty tough to beat, man. It really is. I mean, it's the best is on, was on display this past weekend at the, at the, at the end of it. You know what I mean? Like, you had the top two heavyweights in the world, both of them undefeated. And regardless of how long it took to get to that point or the roads that it took to get to that point, at least we got there. And um, what could have been uh, a boring fight or whatever it could be, like it exceeded everybody's expectations. I wasn't sure what I was, what I was going to expect in that fight. I thought, you know, that it was just going to be a high level chess match, which it was. There was a lot of thinking and 
you know, each guy trying to like maneuver the other one into doing what they wanted. And it was just absolute brilliance though, you know, and um, couldn't have asked for anything more. You know, I can't, I don't know. I can't anticipate the rematch being as good as this one, but you just never know. I didn't anticipate this one being as good as it ended up being, but that's the beauty of this sport. And that's the beauty of heavyweight boxing is that sometimes it can be shitty for all the fights that we get of two plotting guys who don't know how to fight, just kind of waddling into each other. And then just, you know, they're sloshing around and it's just boring, meandering, whatever it may be. You get brilliance like this. And it reminds you why we love this sport. So yeah, kudos to both of them for that. Thank you, your excellency. Appreciate it. And, and, and I just say like, boxing off often essentially we hand out a participation trophy and i think it's deserved because it takes huge balls to go into this it's so dangerous you're playing with your life but it's interesting with participation trophies right because we hand them out for the military we hand it out for religious people we hand it out for the police it's not based on conduct it's just participation where we say oh you must be brave to do it but every now and again you get two guys like this and it's not just that they're participating, that we're like rewarding their courage, but they show so much courage that distinguishes them from 99% of the guys who are showing all that courage by participating. And that's what we saw with both of these guys. Fury coming back from that, that ninth round, eighth round, um, was spectacular. Like that was so hard to dig himself out of, as, as we've seen him do over and over and over again. And Usyk never backed down for a second, despite how dangerous Fury has shown himself to be and, and how much, how dangerous he showed himself to be in that fight. It wasn't like we were seeing an off Fury and it was reputation like Mike Tyson, intimidation that the person's reacting to. That guy is as dangerous as his reputation and he still was willing to go through fire to do what he did the entire fight. He not only didn't take a round off, he didn't take five seconds off. That's yeah. how he achieved what he did. And he's done that his whole career. Like we said, 370 fights um across amateur and the pros you know his entire life he's been doing this and in his off time he volunteers to go over to ukraine to fight that's who this guy is as champ of the world right now that's something absolutely in my off time i look at box rec yeah so i I'm, what i'm saying is i don't compare is i'm i don't have that courage <laughs> i don't do shit in my off time you guys i feed feed this guy behind my shoulder Who's waiting for a snack? That's courageous. My off time is the other one. Walks like an old man. <laughs> what we're saying is that weird, absolute shit compared to these guys, and they deserve all the plaudits. After Bobby Chez, Usyk is my number one guy as a cruiserweight and as a heavyweight. That's what I'll say. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, the, the second best cruiserweight to heavyweight story. Sure. <laughs> no question. All time. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, I appreciate it, man. You know, because I know that it's not uh, with the 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 emotions are still hot, dude. Uh, we're still excited about this shit. I appreciate you guys coming on, talking some shit, talking a little bit of history too. You know, having a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it, man. Oh, I mean, if, if Holyfield hadn't used the thing in Chez's eye, this would have been the Bobby Chez story. Yep, we'd be talking about Chez still to this. Well, we still are. What are you <laughs> He's still about? champ. Yeah, we're nothing's gonna stop us thanks guys all right well as far as all of the social media and all that type of stuff goes if you listen to the knuckles and gloves podcast on any of those audio or podcast apps go ahead and subscribe give us a rating a little bit of a comment and those kinds of things we like those things on youtube watch subscribe like and all that type of stuff as well look for all of us on social media well the knuckles and gloves podcast is on instagram and Facebook, but we're all separately also on Twitter and Instagram and all those sorts of things. Just kind of keep a lookout. Guys, we will talk soon. Have a good one, yeah. You too, guys.